Welcome to Hashtag Share a Story. My name's Nicola and I am going to read to you from Five Children and It by E. Nesbitt. Okay. Grown up people find it very difficult to believe really wonderful things unless they have what they call proof. But children will believe almost anything and grown ups know this. That is why they tell you that the earth is round, like an orange, when you can see perfectly well that it is flat and lumpy. And why they say that the earth goes round the sun when you can see for yourself any day that the sun gets up in the morning and goes to bed at night like a good sun. And the earth knows its place and lies as still as a mouse. Yet I dare say you believe all that about the earth and the sun. And if so, you will find it quite easy to believe that before Anthea and Cyril and the others had been a week in the country, they had found a fairy. At least they called it that because that was what it called itself. And of course, it knew best. But it was not at all like any fairy you ever saw or heard of or read about. It was at the gravel pits. Father had to go away suddenly on business and mother had gone away to stay with granny who was not very well. They both went in a great hurry and when they were gone the house seemed dreadfully quiet and empty and the children wandered from one room to another and looked at the bits of paper and string on the floors left over from the packing and not yet cleared up and wished they had something to do. It was Cyril who said, I say, let's take our Margate spades and go and dig in the gravel pits. We can pretend it's seaside. Father said it was once, Anthea said. He says there are shells there, thousands of years old. So they went. Of course, they had been to the edge of the gravel pit and looked over, but they had not gone down into it for fear father should say they mustn't play there. And the same with the chalk quarry. The gravel pit is not really dangerous if you don't try to climb down the edges, but go the slow, safe way round by the road, as if you were a cart. Each of the children carried its own spade and took it in turns to carry the lamb. He was the baby, and they called him that because Ba was the first thing he ever said. They called Anthea Panther which seems silly when you read it, but when you say it, it sounds a little like her name. The gravel pit is very large and wide, with grass growing round the edges at the top and dry, stringy wild flowers, purple and yellow. It is like a giant's wash hand basin and there are mounds of gravel and holes in the sides of the basin where gravel has been taken out and high up in the steep sides there are the little holes that are the little front doors of the little sand martins little houses. The children built a castle of course but castle building is rather poor fun when you have no hope of the swishing tide ever coming in to fill up the moat and wash away the drawbridge and at the happy last to wet everybody, up to the waist at least. Cyril wanted to dig out a cave to play smugglers in, but the others thought it might bury them alive. So it ended in all spades going to work to dig a hole through the castle to Australia. These children, you see, believed that the world was round and that on the other side, the little Australian boys and girls were really walking wrong way up, like flies on the ceiling, with their heads hanging down into the air. The children dug and they dug and they dug and their hands got sandy and hot and red and their faces got damp and shiny. The lamb had tried to eat the sand and had cried so hard when he found that it was not, as he had supposed, brown sugar that he was now tired out and was lying asleep in a warm, fat bunch in the middle of the half-finished castle. 
This left his brothers and sisters free to work really hard. And the hole that was to come out in Australia soon grew so deep that Jane, who was called Pussy for short, begged the others to stop. Suppose the bottom of the hole gave way suddenly, she said, and you tumbled out among the little Australians. All the sand would get in their eyes. Yes, said Robert, and they would hate us and throw stones at us and not let us see the kangaroos or possums or blue gums or emu bram birds or anything. Cyril and Anthea knew that Australia was not quite so near as all that, but they agreed to stop using the spades and go on with their hands. This was quite easy because the sand at the bottom of the hole was very soft and fine and dry, like sea sand. And there were little shells in it. Fancy it having been wet sea here once, all sloppy and shiny, said Jane, with fishes and conger eels and coral and mermaids. And mass of ships and wrecked Spanish treasure. Oh, I wish we could find a gold doubloon or something, Cyril said. How did the sea get carried away? Robert asked. Not in a pail, silly, said his brother. Father says the earth got too hot underneath, like you do in bed sometimes. So it just hunched up its shoulders and the sea had to slip off like the blankets do off us. And the shoulder was left sticking out and turned into dry land. Let's go and look for shells. I think that little cave looks likely, and I see something sticking out there like a bit of wrecked ship's anchor, and it's beastly hot in the Australian hole. The others agreed, but Anthea went on digging. She always liked to finish a thing when she had once begun it. She felt it would be a disgrace to leave that hole without getting through to Australia. The cave was disappointing, because there were no shells, and the wrecked ship's anchor turned out to be only the broken end of a pickaxe handle. And the cave party were just making up their minds that the sand makes you thirstier when it is not by the seaside, and someone had suggested going home for lemonade, when Anthea suddenly screamed, Cyril, come here! Oh, come quick! It's alive! It'll get away! Quick! They all hurried back. It's a rat. I shouldn't wonder, said Robert. Father says they infest old places, and this must be pretty old if the sea was here thousands of years ago. Perhaps it's a snake, said Jane, shuddering. Let's look, said Cyril, jumping into the hole. I'm not afraid of snakes. I like them. If it is a snake, I'll tame it, and it will follow me everywhere, and I'll let it sleep round my neck at night. No, you won't, said Robert firmly. He shared Cyril's bedroom. But you may if it's a rat. Oh, don't be silly, said Anthea. It's not a rat. It's much bigger and it's not a snake. It's got feet. I saw them. And fur. No, not the spade. You'll hurt it. Dig with your hands. And let it hurt me instead. Well, that's so likely, isn't it? Said Cyril, seizing a spade. Oh, don't, said Anthea. Squirrel, don't. I... It sounds silly, but it said something. It really and truly did. What? It said, you let me alone. But Cyril merely observed that his sister must have gone off her nut. And he and Robert dug with spades while Anthea sat on the edge of the hole, jumping up and down with hotness and anxiety. They dug carefully. And presently, everyone could see that there really was something moving in the bottom of the Australian hole. Then Anthea cried out, I'm not afraid, let me dig, and fell on her knees and began to scratch like a dog does when he has suddenly remembered where it was that he buried his bone. Oh, I felt fur, she cried, half laughing and half crying. I did indeed, I did, when suddenly a dry, husky voice in the sand made them all jump back, and their hearts jumped nearly as fast as they did. Let me alone, it said. And now everyone heard the voice and looked at the others to see if they had too. But we want to see you, said Robert bravely. 
I wish you'd come out, said Anthea, also taking courage. Oh, well, if that's your wish, the voice said, and the sand stirred and spun and scattered and something brown and furry and fat came rolling out into the hole and the sand fell off it and it sat there yawning and rubbing the ends of its eyes with its hands. I believe I must have dropped asleep, it said, stretching itself. The children stood round the hole in a ring, looking at the creature they had found. It was worth looking at. Its eyes were on long horns like a snail's eyes, and it could move them in and out like telescopes. It had ears, like a bat's ears, and its tubby body was shaped like a spider's and covered with thick, soft fur. Its legs and arms were furry too, and it had hands and feet like a monkey's. What on earth is it? Jane said. Shall we take it home? The thing turned its long eyes to look at her and said, Does she always talk such nonsense, or is it only the rubbish on her head? That makes her silly. It looked scornfully at Jane's hat as it spoke. Oh, she doesn't mean to be silly, Anthea said gently. We none of us do. Whatever you may think. Don't be frightened. We don't want to hurt you, you know. Hurt me, it said. Me frightened, upon my word. Why, you talk as if I were nobody in particular. All its fur stood out like a cat's when it is going to fight. Well, said Anthea, still kindly, perhaps if we knew who you are in particular, we could think of something to say that wouldn't make you cross. Everything we've said so far seems to have. Who are you? And don't get angry, because really, we don't know. You don't know, it said. Well, I knew the world had changed, but, well, really, do you mean to tell me seriously you don't know a Samiad when you see one? A Samiad? That's Greek to me. So it is to everyone, said the creature sharply. Well, in plain English, then, a sand fairy. Don't you know a sand fairy when you see one? It looked so grieved and hurt that Jane hastened to say, Oh, of course, I, I, I see you are now. It's quite plain. Now one comes to look at you. You came to look at me several sentences ago, it said crossly, beginning to curl up again in the sand. Oh, don't go away again. Do talk more. Robert cried. I didn't know you were a sand fairy, but I knew directly I saw you that you were much the wonderfulest thing I'd ever seen. The sand fairy seemed a shade less disagreeable after this. It isn't talking, I mind, it said, as long as you're reasonably civil, but I'm not going to make polite conversation for you. If you talk nicely to me, perhaps I'll answer you. Perhaps I won't. Now say something. Of course, no one could think of anything to say. But at last, Robert thought of, How long have you lived here? And he said it at once. Oh, ages. Several thousand years, replied the Samiad. Tell us all about it. Do. It's all in books. You aren't, Jane said. Oh, tell us everything you can about yourself. We don't know anything about you, and you are so nice. The sand fairy smoothed his long, rat-like whiskers and smiled between them. Do please tell, said the children all together. It is wonderful how quickly you get used to things, even the most astonishing. Five minutes before, the children had had no more idea than you that there was such a thing as a sand fairy in the world. And now they were talking to it as though they had known it all their lives. I hope you have enjoyed hashtag share a story from Roundabout Drama Therapy. Storytelling and story making are at the heart 
of how Roundabout ensures everyone's issues and voices can be heard. If you would like to make a donation to support the work of the charity, they would be very grateful for your support. A small gift will make a big difference to the children and adults they support. Thank you.